Welcome to the Knowledge Clip on Jurisdiction and Immunities on International Law. I will first address jurisdiction and then go on to discuss the question of immunities. First, jurisdiction. Jurisdiction relates to the authority of states to enact their laws and to enforce their laws, possibly with respect to events that have occurred outside their territory. Then we would talk about extraterritorial jurisdiction and then obviously it might become quite interesting from an international law perspective if you enact laws uh, that have some effect outside your territory on the territory of another sovereign. International law distinguishes between prescriptive and enforcement jurisdiction. Prescriptive jurisdiction refers to the power, the authority of states to set laws in relation to acts, to events, persons which may or may not have a link to the territory. Secondly, there is enforcement jurisdiction which refers to the power of states to enforce their laws possibly abroad, for instance by sending your police officers or your military troops. In the Lotus case, it was decided that states are basically free to prescribe their jurisdiction as they please. So can, they can enact laws which also have an extraterritorial dimension, for instance, which penalize acts that have been done outside the territory. On the other hand, there is a clear prohibition to enforce your jurisdiction abroad. So you cannot simply send your military or, or police troops abroad. That would be a violation of the principle of non-intervention. And so in the Lotus case, it was decided that states could basically do as they please unless there is a prohibitive rule to the contrary. And in this very case, Turkey could exercise jurisdiction over a uh, collision which has happened had happened on the high seas which is a an area outside national jurisdiction the officer of the watch which had set foot on uh, uh, the shores of turkey in constantinople could be prosecuted by uh, turkish prosecutors and this was in fact an instance of extraterritorial jurisdiction in practice however there are four principles of prescriptive jurisdiction that states consider uh, that have to be met before uh, an exercise of prescriptive jurisdiction is lawful under customary international law. Territoriality, personality, protection and universality. The territoriality principle speaks for itself. Territoriality means a crime has been committed on the territory of, for instance, the Netherlands, the Netherlands will have jurisdiction, even if the perpetrator and or the victim have another nationality. Secondly, the personality principle. The active personality principle refers to jurisdiction that is exercised on the basis of the nationality of the offender, whereas the passive personality principle refers to the nationality of the victim. So if a Dutch person goes abroad, for instance, to Brazil and commits a crime in Brazil. Brazil will obviously have territorial jurisdiction, but also the Netherlands will have active personality jurisdiction because the perpetrator was Dutch. When the victim was Dutch, you're a Dutch tourist, you go to Brazil and you are the victim of an aggression there. Possibly the Netherlands will also have jurisdiction on the basis of the passive personality principle but it has to be uh, remarked that this only applies to more serious crimes. Thirdly, the principle of protection or of security, which relates to the protection of the political sovereignty and independence of the state. It is not uh, often used. Uh, it is, for instance, used when currency is counterfeited, when uh, euros are counterfeited outside the European Union, outside the Netherlands. The Netherlands would have jurisdiction to prosecute the counterfeiters. Fourthly, the universality principle. The, th the first three principles actually function on the basis of a nexus with the state. The universality principle does not. It operates on the basis of the gravity of the crime. 
Universal jurisdiction means that every single state has jurisdiction over a perpetrator of an international crime. Often, uh, the uh, states exercising universal jurisdiction will require the presence of the offender, however. There are a limited number of international crimes, for instance, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, torture, and some crimes of terrorism. And over those crimes, every single state could exercise jurisdiction, irrespective of where the crime has been committed, who has been the perpetrator, or who has been the victim of this international crime. You always need a treaty basis or a customary law basis, however, for that. Then we move to immunities. So a state may have jurisdiction, for instance, territorial jurisdiction, but then there is an obstacle. There is a procedural impediment because a person over whom jurisdiction is exercised is a very important person in international law, and there are quite a number of such VIPs. For instance, states, state officials, diplomats for instance, international organizations and their officials. Let's start with state immunity. The principle is that a state is, immunity, is immune from the jurisdiction of another state. Thus, in the Netherlands, you cannot sue another state. However, in the course of the 20th century, some exceptions have been carved out, and it is now widely accepted that states do not enjoy immunity in relation to commercial transactions. For instance, if you sell goods to the embassy, the embassy doesn't pay the invoice, then you can sue the state. The state cannot say that it enjoys immunity before the jurisdiction, from the jurisdiction of the domestic courts. The question has arisen whether this also extends to human rights violations or international crimes. The International Court of Justice in the jurisdiction 12 has decided that states continue to enjoy immunity in respect of international crimes because these are related uh, to the exercise of sovereignty. This is not a commercial transaction. So this is a bit of a strange situation then, perhaps, that there is no immunity for commercial transactions, but there is immunity for human rights violations and international crimes. But this is the situation as it is right now in international law. Let's move to the immunity of state officials. We have to make a distinction between personal immunity and functional immunity. Personal immunity applies to very important state officials. For instance, diplomats or high-ranking officials, and then I'm really only talking about heads of states, uh, heads of government and ministers of foreign affairs. These persons enjoy an absolute immunity from the jurisdiction of foreign courts, even in relation to private acts. So if a diplomat happens to kill his or her spouse, he or she will still enjoy immunity from the jurisdiction of the state where he is accredited. The question has arisen whether this also applies to violations of human rights or more precisely to international crimes, for instance incitement to genocide. The International Court of Justice in the arrest warrant case in 2002 has decided that immunity continues to apply in relation to international crimes of which a Minister of Foreign Affairs has been accused. So it is really an absolute immunity which extends to human rights violations as well. Secondly, functional immunity. Functional immunity accrues to every single state official, the highest and the lowest, so also regular police officers. As long as they commit acts in an official capacity, they will enjoy immunity um, in relation to those acts. Some courts have decided, however, that this immunity does not extend 
to human rights violations and international crimes. For instance, the English House of Lords decided in 2000 that Pinochet, the uh, uh, General Pinochet, who was formerly the head of state uh, of Chile, but at the time he was prosecuted was just a senator, so uh, a lower-ranking state official not entitled to immunity because he was accused of torture. Finally, the immunity of international organizations and their staff. The immunity of international organizations is typically laid down in international treaties or more precisely headquarters agreements concluded between the organization and the state where the organization is headquartered. These headquarters agreements typically provide for functional immunity. The international organization is entitled to immunity in relation to acts that relate to the fulfillment of its mission. In practice, this largely means that the immunity of international organizations is absolute. We can give one example. The United Nations was sued in the Netherlands in relation to the Srebrenica massacre in 1995. The UN was accused of standing idly by. And the United Nations said, we enjoy immunity as an international organization. And this was accepted by Dutch courts and finally also by the European Court of Human Rights in Mothers of Srebrenica, which considered immunity as a lawful limitation of the right of access to a court of victims. So, concluding, we have a number of important persons in international law and different immunity regimes attached to those different persons. Thank you.